All right, we're finished with 1 Corinthians 15, and we talked about the resurrection for a long time, and I hope that was helpful to you. I got a lot of good comments. We're going to go through the book of Joshua for just a few weeks and pick some of the important lessons out of there, and I think they'll be valuable to you. Um, would you stand with me? And I'm going to read Joshua 1, 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Whatever you set foot, you, wherever you set foot, you will be on land that I have given you from the Negev wilderness in the south to Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east and to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it night and day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And let's pray. Lord, it's a simple prayer, but it's a heartfelt one. We ask that the Holy Spirit would be among us, open our hearts, give life to the words and teaching. May your word nourish us in a way that helps us go forward in our Christian life. Many of us struggle with fear or discouragement, and as we lay the foundation to talk about that and to challenge us to rise up and to lead as you would have us to lead in a world that truly needs believers in Jesus Christ. May we give our whole hearts to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Imagine this news. Imagine that you're an Israelite. Moses has been your leader for 40 years. You've seen him in the middle of miracles. You've seen the wisdom of God in his face and in his words. You've come to the place where you were supposed to come to years ago, finally, and we're ready to go into the land, and God says, Moses, you can't go. Your time is done. And Moses goes up into a mountain, and he dies. And so, here are the people. And Joshua has God speaking to him. I think that must have been a little bit of a frightful thing. But you think about what they went through. There was no social media, no political structure, no succession plan. There was nobody there to spread the news. Now, you can debate whether you want to, whether you think the news is reliable or not, but at least we have a flow of information. All they had was word of mouth, and that probably wasn't any more trustworthy. Um, they didn't have social media, and they didn't have any political structure. Now, when you look at political structures around the world, maybe you think, oh, that's a good thing, but there was none of that. There was no succession plan. I remember this day even as a boy. I was seven, and uh, John F. Kennedy had been killed, and they had to swear Lyndon Johnson in, and that was a scary time. It unsettled the whole country. Many people point to those difficult events as a turning point for the whole country, that the country began to experience difficulty in a way that it never had. 
and, but we had at least a system in place that would smoothly transfer power. Think about what goes on a lot of places in the world. It's not anything but smooth. But uh, think about this. These were kind of nomad people. They've been wandering around in the desert for 40 years, dependent on one man, and now if they don't have leadership, the whole nation could disintegrate. It could fall into chaos. It could fall into crime. They could just scatter as people. They didn't have homes. They didn't have businesses. They didn't have a country of their own as, as we would understand it. And so here they are. Moses is dead. Now, the idea that the country could disintegrate without leadership, that's true for every nation. That's true for every institution. That's true for every relationship. Someday I'd like to talk about that for a long time, but we can't today. But even in your relationships, you'll always have one party who is a better leader than the other and one who helps everybody else go along. A lot of times when a family loses a patriarch or a matriarch, it really sets the family on edge. So leadership and the need to use your gifts as God has given them to you and as God has called you to do is very important for the health of a country at every level, not just national politics, but in workplaces, in relationships. And when that gap exists, when people don't step up and allow themselves to be used by God, everything is in trouble. Now, again, no election. What do they do? So here's Joshua. He's chosen by God to lead. Now, could you imagine if we had news media covering that? Oh, sure. God told him he's the leader. Well, who do you think you are, Joshua? What qualifies you to do that? We haven't had any debates. We, we haven't had any polls. Uh, you're just going to step up and you're going to take the reins yourself? Yeah, that's what happened. God told him. I don't know how often God spoke to Joshua because God typically had been talking to Moses and Moses would talk to Aaron and Aaron would talk to the people. So I don't know how many conversations face to face Joshua had with God, but all of a sudden God says, Joshua, it's your time. If you just think about normal human life, do you think he was nervous? Yeah. I think he was probably terrified. You're talking about millions of people. No army, no police, no structure to the civilization as we would understand it. And they're going into a new land full of people who will be enemies. A land they don't know the geography of, they don't know the climate of, they don't know the dangers of, and, oh, Joshua, good for you. You're in charge, man. How many of you wish you were Joshua right now? Not me. But he's chosen by God to lead. And he has to take charge. He has to fill that void. He has to be that leader. This is God's plan. If he doesn't do what God wants him to do, trouble will come to the people. And the task seems impossible. Now... Listen to these words. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. When you see a therefore in the Bible, you always want to ask this question. What is the therefore? Therefore. What is it referring to? Okay? Plain and simple. He wants Joshua immediately to understand the reality of what he faces. Moses is dead. He's not coming back. God's not going to resurrect him, at least not at this time, someday in the future, but not here. So, Joshua, right now, you've got to make a choice, Joshua. Right now, 
you've got to see the importance of who you are and the importance of your gifts and the importance of your experience. And you've got to rise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, unto a land which I do give to them, even the children of Israel. So, can he say, God, let me sleep on it? No. Can he say, you know, I've been working hard as the assistant. Let me take a few weeks vacation and, and, and let, me, let me come back to you and, and we'll talk about it. No. This is right now. God wants obedience right now. And no matter how difficult the task, God wanted Joshua to rise up now and do what was necessary for the sake of others. You think that was appealing? Do you think that was appealing? No. no. Do you think it was comfortable? No. no. Do you think it was easy? No. no. Do you think it was a popular decision? Probably not. Because when somebody gets something, usually somebody else is going, well, I could have done that. I knew him when he was a kid. By golly, I could do better than he could. And you know, I haven't liked so much of Moses' decisions, and he's Moses' assistant, and I just think we need a change. Probably wasn't popular. But it was necessary, and it was God's choice. Now, these things apply to most every leadership and service choice we make. Is it always comfortable to serve? No. Is it always comfortable to be on a board or a committee? No. Is it always comfortable to have responsibilities at church or other places? No. Does it make you the most popular person? Uh-uh. Is it easy? No, nope. nothing about it's easy. Let's never sell it that way. Are we comfortable being pushed out of what we're comfortable with? No. And yet, the need for leaders exists. Again, in every nation, in every community, in every relationship, and in every workplace, those places need those who will step up and fill the voids regardless of their comfort level, regardless of the appeal of the opportunity, regardless of whether it makes them popular, and regardless of whether it's easy. Joshua's a role model for us. God needs leaders. And you know where God gets them? From among us. You know, I've always been taught, and I've had other pastors uh, remind me of this in conversation, that churches typically have the people they need. What they need is people to step up. And that's always our challenge. And nobody sells that as easy, but everybody understands it's necessary. That if we're going to be healthy, that if we're going to have the future we look to, if we're going to have the future we're progressing toward, then people have to choose to make the most of what God's given them and to sometimes step into situations and circumstances that are not their favorite. God needs leaders. Therefore, arise. Now, God keeps saying these encouraging things to Joshua. I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to do that for you, and the enemy's going to be defeated, and oh, be strong and courageous, and then oh, don't fear, and then oh, be strong and courageous. Joshua was a great man. He was a great general, a great conqueror, a strong leader. Why did God have to keep saying that to him? What do you think? Don't look at your notes. Why would God need to say that to you? Encouragement. See, there's a little bit of a tendency to look at these Bible characters and think they were giants. They weren't. They were human beings. They were flawed. They struggled. They sinned. <laughs> they had problems. Sometimes their kids were a mess. 
Sometimes their health was a mess. Sometimes they couldn't find a good decision if it was stapled to their butt. Where is that decision? I can't find it. Should Joshua just believe God? Yeah, he should. And you know what? He struggles to do that. And I'm kind of glad about that in a way because that tells me that when I struggle and then when you struggle, you're not some horrible group of people. We're not all failures who God's continually disappointed in. We're people on a journey just like Joshua, discovering the promises of God and discovering the power of God and learning to conquer the enemies in our lives. That's a lot more exciting than, yeah, he was perfect all the time. I can't be perfect. And he tells Joshua, if it was good for Moses, a great servant, oh, that's, I read that wrong. The point is, if it was good for Moses, and Moses was a great servant of God, if Moses kept having promises, if Moses needed to keep being reminded, if Moses made mistakes at the end of his life that kept him from going to the promised land, and he did, then these same promises, these same hopes are good enough for Joshua. These same hopes are good for us. That's the whole idea of these Old Testament stories. The whole idea, the Scripture says, of these Old Testament stories is to show us what the Christian faith looks like for individuals like us. Well, we go through struggles. Well, we go through battles. Sometimes we step up. Sometimes we don't step up. When we do step up, the world is better. When we don't step up, the world is worse. And God loves us and embraces us along the way. God made promises to Joshua. No enemy will be able to to take you, okay? It's like sending your child to school and saying, no bully's going to beat you up, boy. I got your back. I got you covered. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I will not fail you or forsake thee. Three promises. Defeat of the enemy, God's miraculous presence, and God's always going to be there. Now, if you can internalize those facts and learn to trust those facts, your struggles will go a lot better. Your understanding of God's faithfulness and goodness will be better. But it's all about the promises. It's really not about the hopes we create. You know, I get frustrated. I go by these little gambling places. And in Whiteside County, they are taking in millions of dollars. You know who they're doing that mostly at the expense of? Those who don't have money. And our politicians keep promoting it. And we see poverty increases, and it increases, and it increases, and people have more needs, and more needs, and more needs. You know what we really need? We really need the promises of God. We really need to understand that God is faithful, God is with us, God helps us in our difficulties. But he expects us to take our part. God gave Joshua demanding things to do. Our culture has really changed the idea of what it means to have something demanding happen in your life. Now if we have to get up, that's demanding. How many of you had family members maybe that worked on a farm and had to get up before the sun? Anybody? Yeah, me too. I don't ever remember my grandfather my other grandfather, my uncle, uh, my cousins, any of the farmers in the family going, yeah, I had to get up at four and milk the cows. They just went out and milked the cows. Or they just went out and fed the pigs. Or they just went out and did the work. Or in my grandpa's case, he didn't have indoor plumbing. I got told the funniest thing this week. We were talking about how the church... Um, seemed 
to have maybe struggled with just two bathrooms in the place. You know, for years there were two bathrooms in this building and the church um, would run a couple hundred in church. How did you do that? Well, he explained that in his family, it was a matter of pride not to use a public bathroom. Oh my goodness. He explained that when his father was forced by the city to tie into the uh, sewage system and to have indoor bathroom, grandfather wouldn't use it because grandfather said that shouldn't be done in the house. Our definition of what's hard has changed, hasn't it? The thing that hasn't changed is it still takes great effort to make things that are worthwhile work properly. And that's the reality in the church. Not everything promised by others is real. You know, we look at these promises of God, but other people make all kinds of promises to us. Society makes all kinds of promises. But you know, not every promise is real. My immediate successor in Shabana, Dr. Dr. Badal, he, uh, he went to uh, Lowe's, and he was helping a guy, and he noticed that the guy had a tattoo on his arm in Hebrew. And the guy didn't know he, sp- he spoke and wrote Hebrew. He's a... Uh, college professor now and uh, just for curiosity he asked the guy do you know what that means and and why do you have it and he said well he said it means brotherhood and he said I told him no that's not the word it's a different Hebrew word the word you have on your arm means goat you have the word goat on your arm the guy said what and Dr. Badal said I think you've been taken son you thought you got brotherhood on your arm and you got a goat. <laughs> True story. Now, I've heard of that happen a lot with, with Asian um, lettering, but this is the first time I've heard it happen with Hebrew. But, you know, that's a true picture of life. A lot of people out there dangling promises in front of you, and God says, hey, if you want real promises, if you want real guarantees, serve me, I'll make it worth it. It'll be worth your trouble, and the world around you will be better because of it. God makes promises. Therefore, rise. Get up. Do something. Don't sit and compare yourself to the rest of the world. The rest of the world is in trouble. We just have to choose, choose ourselves to serve God. Well... Kids are a little early today. Uh, <clears throat> Joshua was told, don't fear. Joshua was told, choose courage. Joshua was told, don't be dismayed. Now listen, folks. This is true, this is true, this is true. The attitudes that you practice will be the attitudes that define you. If you choose to not look on the bright side, you'll be gloomy. If you choose to look on the bright side, you'll be cheerful. If you choose not to trust God, you'll feel hopeless. If you choose to trust God, you'll be hopeful. Practicing faith increases faith.